we as societies, the way in which we interact, the way in which we pursue self-interest is at the root of the catastrophic risks that could end us all. If we're going to come through this conflict without nuclear weapons being used and without a huge wound going through Europe for the next few decades, we have to put greater effort into drawing the Russians into a collaborative relationship in Europe. You can't have a credible threat unless you're willing to use nuclear weapons. So the risk of nuclear use is inherent in the possession of nuclear weapons. Hello, everyone. This is Maz. Before we get to the next episode with Paul Ingram from the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge, I just want to highlight that this episode was recorded in mid-June. However, given what is currently going on in Ukraine, I think you'll find the discussion very relevant today. The only event we discussed, which has occurred in the interim, is the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, which occurred in August. I have shared a link in the show notes, should you wish to read the results of the conference. But in short, it ended without any substantive outcomes due to, unsurprisingly, opposition by one member state. No prizes for guessing which state that was. Okay, enough preamble, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. My guest today is Paul Ingram, who is the Academic Program Manager at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. Up to a few months ago, he was also the Director of Emergent Change, which he established to further the understanding and practice of the stepping stone approach to nuclear disarmament. Prior to that, he was the Executive Director at British American Security Information Council, where he developed the stepping stones approach, along with his colleagues from the Swedish Foreign Ministry. Throughout his extensive career, Paul has worked across the world on many projects related to nuclear disarmament. He joins me today to discuss some of our greatest existential risks, with a particular focus on nuclear proliferation. Paul, thanks for joining me on The Voices of War. It's great to be here, Baz. Paul, uh, as I've alluded to uh, as we first started chatting, you have one of those absolutely amazing careers uh, that seem to be difficult to package in a, uh, in a short biography. How do you describe what you do? Uh, it's really difficult. Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah. the first thing is, first thing is, is that uh, you know I work now at Cambridge University, which I, I feel is a bit of a cosmic joke because <laughs> I'm not an academic, mm. but they call me an academic program manager. I, <laughs> I yeah. and yet you know I'm starting to realise that academics are waking up to the fact that there is a real world out there that mm. is not just something you can get to grips with by theories, but you actually have to experience it. And uh, at the centre, we uh, are often doing foresight exercises and imagination, uh, thinking about, but also um, going deep into the emotions and the and the the, f- the full sense of mm. of what it means to face the end of the world. You know, uh, that's what <laughs> yeah. we are looking at. Our centre was set up to think about the end of the world. You know, asteroids and volcanoes. Yes, you know, asteroids uh, hit out the dinosaurs. But, you know, most of the threats that we face today are of our own making. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. nuclear weapons is obvious, but climate change as well, obviously, and artificial intelligence and the possibility of the machines taking over and uh, the breakdown of uh, supply chains and and, um, collapses in the civilization, which basically come about because of greed or fear or inability to get global governments off the ground. And... That's what I've spent most of my career in pretty much my whole career on is the dysfunction of global governance, because we have this system whereby people get elected or appoint themselves yeah. or come into power by coups. They run their countries and they then fight wars or engage mm. in conflict of a variety of ways. And this is really deeply problematic. And, you know, some people some very famous people earlier in the last century started talking about world government and other Mm. means that it it, it almost reproduces the same problem because uh, of the power battles. Mm. So my challenge 
my challenge to myself, to the centre and to all your listeners is how do we organise ourselves in the 21st century in a way that reduces, we won't ever eliminate, but reduce the potential threat that we face as a species and one that we we impose upon the earth? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fantastic question, I guess, to open up with. Uh, and I didn't plan to go there, but how, how do we do it? What are your thoughts? Because you're talking about incentives and incentives or what motivates people to seek power, then of course, retain power, which ultimately seems to be a product of the human species, right? Our in-group versus out-group competition, in-group bias, et cetera. Uh, All of that plays into it, which is then incentivized through our economic uh, system. So yeah, it's, it's a really complex problem. It's a deeply, deeply complex problem. And there are no simple solutions. In fact, possibly no solutions. So I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. It's a deliberately open question. It's a question that I think demands open inquiry, exchange of uh, Mm. ideas and possibilities. But, you know, one thing I would do uh, right from the get go on this question is to say, look, we don't have the answers and we are operating on a number of assumptions that are deeply ingrained. So, You articulated a couple just now, particularly around the idea that as species, we are inevitably competitive. True and false. Mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. like, you know, the reason why Homo sapiens uh, prevailed in the evolutionary competition, and it is a competition, is because we cooperated. Mm -hmm. So Homo sapiens do have the ability to cooperate over large-ish groups. And maybe there are ways and means, technology and changes in behavior or, mm. or, or, or deliberate choices where we could actually start to roll out that cooperation at a much higher level. And that's what I'm looking at in my collaboration with a, a whole series of governments. You know, We exist in a world where the threat of nuclear annihilation is a very real threat. This year with the Ukraine war, that threat has become all the more clear and obvious, Mm, but mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, or at least let's put it this way. We need for our own survival to start challenging those deep assumptions and search for ways in which we can encourage it. You know, this isn't this isn't just about wishing away the problems of the world. Mm. It's about nibbling away at some of the worst dimensions of them mm. so that we can control the situation. So, for example, I'm not encouraging states to say we can do without nuclear weapons next year. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just not that easy. But what I am encouraging states to do is to think about ways in which we can strengthen the systems Mm. that control the nuclear weapons, where nuclear weapon states can deepen their guarantees to non-nuclear weapon states that they won't threaten them with nuclear weapons, and that we work together rather than in competition Mm. to try to build the um, structures of international society in a way that uh, reduce the likelihood of nuclear conflict. Mm. I often say on the podcast, I'm as close to a pacifist as one could possibly be wearing the uniform, which basically suggests that I do somewhere deep down hold the belief that uh, humans can live without war as much as we're proving to ourselves that we find it very difficult to achieve. But I do often come up with the, with the debate, even in my own head, uh, that it comes down to you know, the purpose of a particular social group. And that's what the leadership will do, will set the purpose and a course for a particular nation. And if that purpose or if those interests underpinning that purpose clash with someone else, uh, then it becomes very difficult to negotiate or cooperate because then it becomes a competition. But I mean, I, I serve in the military uh, whose mission is to protect Australia and Australia's interests, right? Um, I, I, I haven't signed the dotted line to fight for Australia's values, uh, which is often the debate that I have about interest versus values, which we're trying to build the world underpinned by certain values and norms, but we live a world and vote for leaders who will pursue interests on our behalf. Uh, and if those interests don't align, uh, then of course we're seeing clashes. So the challenge seems to be we need a common enemy, but could that be one of these existential threats potentially? that forces us into cooperation. Yeah, so that is fascinating. And it's one of the one of the things that I'm asking governments that I'm in cooperation with at the moment. Up to now, up to now, we have 
established the United Nations system on the basis, ultimately, of trying to bring peace and security to mm. the world through cooperation between mm. governments. But I think the 21st century challenge is how do we ensure that these, these global governance structures that we have assist us to collaborate to avoid the global catastrophic risks that mm. we face today. Mm. So the peace and security part of this is retained, but it's only part of the broader issue, which is that we as societies, the way in which we interact, the way in which we pursue self-interest mm -hmm. is at the root of the catastrophic risks that could end us all. Mm. And people often ask me, you know, don't you get really depressed uh, <laughs> when you're constantly looking at question, the end of the world? <laughs> it is, it is. But my depression is not so much about the possibility of the end of the world. It's actually about recognizing that the cause, the root causes lie, not just in those people over there, you know, the Russians yeah. invading Ukraine. It's really, really bad. The Russians, Ukraine, you know, I condemn them every yeah. moment, if you ask me. But yeah. it's not just the Russians, yes. you know, yes. it's it's within each one of us. And, you know, I, I, I think what you were articulating earlier is really interesting is actually if we recognize that these conflicts are internal mm. as much as they are external. If those of us who are within the armed forces think about what are the deep values, as you say, that draw us into a life of service mm. and how can we live that life of service with integrity what mm. does integrity mean? I will spend all my days with somebody asking those questions rather mm. than somebody who says, I'm a pacifist. Mm. I reject yeah. all conflict. I reject this, that, and the other. I'm going to remain pure. Mm. Because mm. I'm not interested in people who want to be pure. What I'm interested in is people who are willing to struggle mm. internally and externally for the values and the integrity that drives them into a life of service, whether that's in uniform or mm. in another form, because yeah. that's what we are all called to do. That's uh, uh, again, that's so uh, wonderful. I mean, it's it's completely off script now. I mean, in in any sense of my questions, but it, you're you're hitting on so many of my own triggers because my partner and I spent a bit of time in Bosnia to establish a uh, not for profit. Uh, it was a sports center. It was a CrossFit gym, country's first CrossFit gym. Don't hold that against me, you or, or listeners. <laughs> I'm no longer part of the cult. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we did establish it as a kind of a, as a not for profit, and we did some charity work and kind of try to build a community. And one of the things that I realized is that. Most people want to do good, and most people mm. are fundamentally good. It's just that they need to have the bumpers in place to right. allow them the opportunity to exercise their goodness. And right. then even when they're bad, as I would perceive them as bad, ultimately, in their view, they're doing something good for whoever it is that they're Absolutely. trying to represent, uh, and which is why Absolutely. I totally under I agree with you when you say about it's not just the Russians. <laughs> like the Russians yeah. don't live in a, you know, they don't live in a, in isolation to the rest of the world. None of us live in isolation to the rest of the world. We're part of the same ecosystem and there's an interplay yeah. and a, and a yeah. action, reaction, action, reaction that, and this current war didn't start on the 24th of February, nor did it start in 2014. You know, it started decades right. ago. Uh, and this is a yeah. manifestation of that. And I think that's, that's kind of the point that you're trying to make is that value is something much deeper than uh, short-term interests. But uh, just before we get too much deeper into it, I do want to ask why and how did you get interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear war in particular? Sure. So um, so I started at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, I was uh, very much one of those people that uh, was purist and a pacifist. Yeah, right. And uh, and uh, and I used to break into uh, air force bases uh, uh, with <laughs> okay. nuclear weapons in and plant plant bowls beside the runway. I would right. um, I'd, I'd I'd organize those peace marches and uh, and I and I worked very closely with Jeremy Corbyn uh, when I was uh, on Stop the War Coalition. I represented the Greens and organized the uh, the massive demonstrations in London at the beginning of this century against the Iraq War. Oh and, wow! Okay. Uh, so, you know, I come from that stock. And um, at the same time, uh, I was, was as, as I say, I was active in the Green Party. I was possibly the most powerful Green in this country, in the UK, when leading a city council, Oxford wow. City Council. 
Wow. And was the Green Party's defence spokesperson. But the truth of it is that I got involved because my brother, who was my hero, was at college and got involved in the campaign for nuclear disarmament. And when I heard about nuclear weapons, I just felt this It was a chill, but it was also an anger. It was an anger towards these elderly white men Mm, (laughs) who mm, were holding mm. the world to ransom. And I, I made a decision very early on in life, you know, even before I was a teenager, that I was going to devote myself to trying to get rid of these things. So I come from that purest stock. And as a result, I think I have quite a lot of judgment for that purist approach, because it's very much a sort of a holier than thou Mm, um, mm. clarity. It's it's a black and white clarity. And the world out there is complex, messy, Mm. difficult. Mm. I mean, along the way, I, I was teaching the National School of Government systems thinking and leadership skills to very senior civil servants. Right. At one stage in 2007, 2008. And I had a bit of a road to Damascus moment because one of these guys came up to me and said, I love what you're teaching. I can see why it's important to include all the different perspectives, you know, this this idea of pluralism and and the holistic treatment, seeing the context and and mm-hmm. and understanding the mess. What I don't understand is how you apply it to your own life in the Green Party. And I looked at him and I saw in that moment that I didn't. You know, Mm. I I thought this was something other people had to do who were in power and Mm. I could remain pure. And at that point on, I thought, actually, what I want to do is I want to remain within the broader sense of the peace movement, but I want to bring this sort of thinking this sort of approach that values different perspectives, that understands that the world we live in is complicated, that values uh, people with very, very different experience, different understanding, different culture to my own, Mm. because they're the ones that have things to teach me. Mm. And I was was a TV talk show host on Iranian state television. Yeah, yeah, which I wanted to get into. (laughs) It's it's incredible. (laughs) And, uh, and And I took up that position because I thought I've got lots to tell the Iranian people about how British thinking is and British politics. I rapidly came to realize that actually they had more to teach me about Iranian culture, Iranian understanding, Iranian challenge and difficulties over the years, the way in which the British legacy within Iran has created or led to the Iranian experience today, how millions of Iranians are suffering under a regime that is very oppressive, Mm. partly as a result of the injustices meted out on Iranians by the British in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Mm. And we have to understand people's history and their pain and their trauma and to actually have empathy, sympathy for that trauma. Just as today, we have to understand the trauma that Russians have been going through for centuries, mainly at the hands of other Russians. It is a particularly brutal society, but it's also a society that has been dealt all sorts of negative hits by Mm. other societies. And if we're going to come through this conflict without nuclear weapons being used and and without a huge wound going through Europe for the next few decades, we have to put greater effort into drawing the Russians into a mm, collaborative mm, relationship mm. in Europe. Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting off the point. No, um, it's wonderful. I, I just, I'll just pick up actually on one point because I think there's a yeah, really sure. thing you said there that again resonated really strongly with uh, some of the teaching that I do now, and that's about trying to see the world through someone else's perspective. When you're talking about the uh, Iranians and, and getting to understand their worldview. It's something that it's so easy for us to forget and and throw away. And and we've seen this in Afghanistan. We see this in Iraq. We see this any place where, uh, you know, certainly from a military context where we've deployed, where we paint a very simple brush over the social group that we're engaging with without forgetting that they, as you said, have their own history. They have their own. And and that history has been forged over centuries in some cases Mm. through interplay and interaction with other, other social groups. Again, none of them, nothing exists in isolation and everything leaves a mark 
in some sense and shapes behavior, shapes perceptions, shapes how, how they will interact with us. Uh, I want to ask you how, do you, how do you respond to people who, and I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, oh, they should just get up and revolt and you know, uh, change their own country. Uh, how, do you, mm. how do you answer to those people? Because, I mean, we hear this about you know, Afghanistan. We hear about Iran, about North Korea, about Russia now. Um, how do you answer that question? Well, uh, it, it, it varies, really, depending on the situation, because everybody's culture is different, the legacies and the dramas and the, and the drivers. But, you know, generally, I would say several things. Firstly, it's really difficult. Mm. I've run social movements in this country, mm. and, and sometimes I've been successful in a democratic election, mm. but it's taken years of slog and sacrifice. And you know, I hate to think what it would be like to be trying to do the same thing in in a society mm. where violence is is much greater, where um, the the state uses all sorts of oppressive techniques to keep keep control. Mm. You know, it's very easy for us in safe states to appeal to mm. Mm. Uh, other people to overcome their their challenges yeah the the general response i see in all states is one of people just getting on with their lives you know i see it in my own community here the cost of living crisis is is mushrooming and people just getting on with their lives and trying their best to survive and the more pressure there is on them the more likely it is that they are going to hunker down and, and try and make the best of it and and i don't judge people mm. people for doing that I think I think we do need to wake mm. up to the bigger challenges and pictures. I think it's important that we recognize that um you know the <laughs> All of this that we're experiencing is under significant threat at the moment from a different a whole variety of mm. different places. But I don't judge people for trying to avoid that mm. because uh, because it's difficult. But you know, c- coming back to what I was saying earlier, I think one can respond mm. to those big challenges with despair or with uh, focusing on one's own life or trying to survive. But actually, there are quite fulfilling meaningful opportunities for people to raise their sights beyond their own lives mm. and actually find meaning and value in working for bigger causes and mm. so there is an opportunity for people in oppressive regimes to find meaning and purpose in, in in challenging that regime but it requires a great deal of innovation novelty taking risks which i don't think anybody has a right to judge other people uh, for, yeah. for for choosing yeah. not to and it takes information and opportunity Absolutely. Uh, as well i mean if if you're saturated in one stream information that tells you only that the West is evil and bad and horrible and wants to exterminate you. Mm. If that's all mm. you're hearing, it takes some strange bumpers in your life to push right. you in a different right. direction. In fact, we're seeing the very impact of poor information diet in social media and the fragmentation yeah. of, you know, particularly Western societies that are being targeted left, right, and center in, in, in you know, into stovepipes in the US yeah. and of course UK. It's certainly again, it's very difficult to then accuse someone of and not going and finding the information or asking the question if yeah. that yeah. you know they don't know what they no, don't absolutely. know. Absolutely. And 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 let me let me take a big risk here. The Russians mm. have a point. The Iranians have a point. Mm-hmm. You know, there are when they when they talk about the way in which they have been treated as a society by the West, they have a very strong point. So it's easier. Mm for these oppressive regimes to survive and even to some extent thrive within their own borders because of Mm. the actions of our government. Now, that's Mm. not to say it's all the West's fault. I'm not saying that for a second. I'm just saying that we're contributing to the problem there. And, you know, to some extent, that's inevitable because we're not perfect. (laughs) You know, my God, Mm. we're not perfect. Mm. I mean, I equally mm. don't judge people in my own country for voting for Boris Johnson, mm. even though I detest, yeah. detest the guy, <laughs> you know, um, because because yeah. they've got their reasons and their reasons yes. are often yes. associated with feeling marginalized, being disempowered and all mm. the rest of it. And people like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, they seem to have a, a way of cutting through and yes. talking to yeah. people's feelings of isolation and uh, marginalization. Mm. Mm. And so those of us yeah. who are interested in in fixing this, in trying to take steps, we can't solve these problems, but we 
can improve them. If we're interested in taking steps to creating governments that are more functional and then an international system that is more functional and addressing these catastrophic risks, we have to actually Mm. work Mm. with the grain of people's sense of marginalization and exclusion. In other words, this is a project, the big project, global project, is one of inclusion and is one of respecting Mm. diversity. So it's a multicultural, massive project of global proportions, which all of us Mm. need to exercise a certain degree of humility when we engage with people who have perspectives that are very different from ours. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. I think that's a uh, yeah, wonderfully, wonderfully put, and it's a, it's a rather inspirational note, particularly given what I'm about to ask you <laughs> now. <laughs> You've already alluded to it, but uh, uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine mm. or the invasion of Ukraine, you know, to what extent has the risk truly increased from your view and from your institute's mm. view of an actual uh, nuclear? Mm. Uh, first strike by either NATO or Russia. Mm. We didn't hear Biden uh, recently uh, promise a no first strike Mm. in their uh, nuclear review. So uh, (laughs) could be anyone. Yeah. So that's a really important point to begin with, is that we often point the finger of blame or risk at others, and we're contributing to it. And there are a whole host of different technical reasons why the Biden administration has failed to follow through on the president's promises before the election to consider. Well, he promised a sole purpose, as in the, the reason why the Americans have nuclear weapons is to protect against the use of nuclear weapons by others. He hasn't even said that. So the Americans mm. retain a policy, as far as we can tell, because the nuclear posture review is still not public. But um, as far mm. as we can mm. tell, uh, they are retaining the right to use nuclear weapons against a state that attacks them without nuclear weapons. And that's a real problem. But Mm. coming to the core of your question, coming up with any clarity when it comes to the quantifying the risk of nuclear exchange, nuclear conflict is really, really challenging because nuclear deterrence, nuclear weapons, you know, It's relatively easy to measure the number. You can go to a Mm. state's policy, but in the end, they are there to affect the psychology of their opponents. And how do you get into the minds of the opponent? It's really challenging. The Americans have a view that the reason why they have nuclear weapons is to threaten other people so much that they won't do what they would otherwise do. I don't Mm. think the Americans have a significant intent to use nuclear weapons, but they have people within their armed forces that are planning on the use of nuclear weapons, and Mm. they're doing so every day. And the reason Mm. for that is to have a credible threat. You can't have a credible threat unless you're willing to use nuclear weapons. So Mm. so the risk of nuclear use mm, is yeah, inherent yeah, yeah. in the possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, sorry, just to, just on that, just yeah. to clarify that, as, as in it's pointless having them if the people, your competitor or position thinks that you're exactly. not going to use it. Exactly. You know, it, it, so, so that's what you mean. It's it's built into the into the system yeah. uh, it, yeah. itself. And, yeah. and the Brits try to skirt this by saying, well, we've got nuclear weapons. They're hidden in a submarine in the depths of the ocean, out of sight, out of mind. We don't talk about using them, although occasionally they do have leaders that do talk about them. But that's sort of um, the exception Mm. rather than the rule. But everybody knows we've got them. The phrase is, we speak softly, but we carry a big stick. And the Mm. problem with that is that people doubt whether the Brits would use them in any circumstances. And so the credibility of their nuclear deterrent is brought under question. So you could imagine a situation where the Brits use their nuclear weapons and surprise everybody because nobody Mm. expects them to use them. The Americans have taken a very different approach and talk about nuclear weapons a lot more and there's much more discourse about them. And of course, President Putin is talking about them a lot in the last few months. Mm. And uh, that is... And Lavrov as yeah. well. I mean, openly, it, openly exactly. threatening. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and, yeah. and that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is every intention of the Russian leadership to use mm. nuclear weapons. It could simply be signaling. And so 
if one believes that it's just simply them posturing and not having any intention of using them, but basically using this situation to remind people that the Russians have a massive Mm -hmm. nuclear arsenal, then you'll think that the risk of nuclear use is quite low. If, on the other hand, Mm -hmm. you start to unpick this and you start to say, well, if the West carries on arming the Ukrainians to the degree that they have been and increasing as the months go by, you know, long range missiles most recently, you've got quite Mm -hmm. a significant number of men under arms in Ukraine that match the Russians or even outmatch them. You've got morale within the Ukrainian armed forces that is uh, sky high compared to the Russians. And you've Mm. got an army that is defending rather than attacking. All of those point Mm. to the possibility of Ukraine at the very least holding the Russians back and in the medium term, Mm. actually pushing them out of Ukraine. What then Mm. happens? Mm. You know, that's Mm. the, that's the really risky point. And, you know, it does bring under question the sustainability of the current Russian leadership if they lose this war. It's very difficult to Mm, see Putin mm. saving face and coming up Mm, with a narrative. mm. And this is why people talk about the need for the Russians to have what's called an off-ramp. It's an Mm, ability to mm. move out of this war without completely losing face, having something to say Mm, mm. for the war. And and if they don't have that off-ramp, the leadership starts looking shaky. And it's when a Mm. leadership looks shaky that the probability of nuclear war goes up from, I don't know, let's say 0.1% chance to one, Mm. two, three, four percent. You know, this is this Mm. is. Um, doesn't necessarily sound too bad, but the consequences are a massive. So yeah, it's like right. if the probability of nuclear war starts to get to be 1% this year, that's really, really scary. Absolutely. I, I mean, I guess one of the things that, and I've recently had some guests discussing this, uh, particularly in, in relation to the war in Ukraine, the credible risk of a collapse of the Russian state post a Ukrainian victory or pushing out the Russian troops out of uh, Ukraine. And then, of course, we know, I mean, uh, I checked it on Cypri just earlier. I mean, Russia has, what, over 6,000 warheads in its inventory. I mean, that, that's that's insane. Yep. To what extent is this something you also think about as part of your scenario building, I guess, because it's, you know, securing all those warheads. It's not necessarily even, you know, that Russia is going to push the button or that Putin's going to push the button, but it's how will we secure all those warheads post a potential collapse and scrambling internally and all the various threat groups that might seek to to hold even parts of a nuclear weapon to, of course, exploit for our own, own advantage? Yeah, so we've, uh, we have we have faced this problem before, and um, I, I've been involved in this game long enough to remember mm. that uh, 1991, 92, 93, when with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were incredibly concerned by this, uh, the control mm. of nuclear warheads. And of course, at that point, we were talking about tens of thousands of nuclear warheads mm. under the Soviet control. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Ukraine itself, of course, everybody knows these days, had its own <laughs> nuclear weapons, or at least nuclear weapons on its own soil. And we were also concerned at the time with the number of Soviet um, scientists that would end up finding their way to Iran, North Korea, or other countries and earn Mm. several times their salary in order to assist those countries with nuclear weapons programs. That could well have happened in North Korea. It didn't happen in Iran, interestingly. But it's a problem. <laughs> it's a significant problem. Mm. And, and at the time, the US Congress passed a, a resolution called the Cooperative Threat Reduction that paid for Americans to cooperate with Russians, to pay Russian scientists to cooperate, to dismantle Soviet nuclear warheads, take the plutonium over to the US and to burn it in US reactors. And uh, a large number of warheads were reduced in that way. The Russians received quite a bit of money for that purpose. Mm, But you mm, know, mm. cooperative threat reduction does not have a good name within Russia today. There's been a lot of history rewriting by Putin and his administration, basically saying that the Americans came in and used their money to defang Russia and that Russia now needs to build itself up again. And uh, Mm. I mean, 
it's a strange story because uh, you know most of those warheads were pretty defunct anyway, and it would have cost a lot Russia a lot of money to keep them going. So, so um, mm. and it supports a narrative, though, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And we all yeah. know because yeah. all of our politicians use mm. narratives to justify things that are unjustifiable. Mm. So, mm. you know, the Russians are hardly mm. alone here. But if the mm. scenario comes to pass that there is some kind of of a collapse of the Putin administration and some chaos within Russia, it is a significant problem. Most of these warheads are under pretty secure care at the moment. The 2,000 odd tactical nuclear weapons that we believe they have are, are all in central storage. You know, none of these are out with um, Russian military. Uh, as far as we know, as far as we know, there are no nuclear mm. warheads in or around Ukraine, though I had heard a rumor, I think it completely unsubstantiated and uh, and I think a bit wild, that there were some suitcase bombs, suitcase nuclear weapons within Ukraine today. Um, that- how, how do you, how, I mean, first, how do you confirm that? How do you know that that's not the case? But also, is that far fetched? Is that an actual potential threat? A suitcase nuclear well, bomb? We do know that the so- or is that a, is that a movie? Oh, yeah. we do know that the Soviets had suitcase nuclear weapons. Okay, they're big suitcases. It'd be difficult for one person to carry <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah, but um, <laughs> yeah. but the right. the rumor was that um, that they did uh, develop these nuclear warheads uh, so that they could be smuggled to their targets mm. rather than delivered. It makes sense from a mm. um, a nuclear deterrent mindset. And mm, so mm. logically, it is possible that the Russians could have smuggled suitcase mm. nuclear weapons into Ukraine, or for that matter, into London or uh, Perth or anywhere mm, else. Mm. But you know, the re- the reason why I'm skeptical is because it's very easy and very quick to be sensationalist about this, and I think mm, it's really mm. important not to fall into the trap of sensationalism. When, frankly speaking, nuclear weapons are sensationalist enough as it is. Yeah. How do we know who's got what and, you know, where they're kept and how trustworthy is the information that mm. we have? So, and again, I'm just referring to uh, CIPRI's, mm. you know, from January 22, uh, uh, World Nuclear Forces kind mm-hmm. of uh, graph, which has, you know, more than 13,000 in total of, across the nine countries that have nukes. Yeah. There's a number that are deployed on subs, on uh, aircraft, yeah. or, you know, in, in in kind of land units that are that are readied for uh, rapid deployment. Of course, they're stored, uh, you know, in cold storage, I guess, like you're saying. But ha- how do we know, as in how do you, you and I know, not somebody sitting at mm. the nuclear headquarters somewhere, but how do you and I know this and how trustworthy is that information? So there's no such thing as 100% certainty. So it's important to treat the numbers with some level of scepticism. There is also mm-hmm. a danger of groupthink. So one organization or government publishes the numbers and then other people use them as sources. But it's like it's like any information at this level. There are a variety of different sources that reference each other. And that's the way intelligence operate in secret as well as the public listings. We don't know, but we are pretty confident. I mean, if I were to give you an example, NATO currently deploys, or rather the US currently deploys within NATO states, a number of free fall nuclear weapons. They're called B61s, the most recent one, B61-12 uh, modification. Uh, these are bombs that at uh, time of war will be loaded handed over to the host country who will then fly them towards the target and then drop them right now uh nato doesn't declare which countries uh, host these bombs but we know with pretty clear al- almost certainty that they are deployed mm. in the netherlands germany belgium italy and turkey they used to be deployed in the yeah. UK, but no longer. And the way in which uh, the researchers, particularly an incredible guy working out of the Federation of American Scientists called Hans Christensen, looks at these things is through satellite imagery. So looking at the different um, air bases and looking at the way in which the troops 
deploy and the protocols. So how many troops are guarding particular buildings and Mm. compares them with nuclear protocols, looking at which air bases deploy in certain exercises, particularly NATO's noon fast annual nuclear exercise, how they deploy, what kinds of aircraft, whether those aircraft are nuclear capable, certified. The Americans, of course, are particularly open about these things with their US Congress and Mm. a lot of those sorts of background information is public. And then you can basically put all your eggs into the different evidence baskets and Mm. come to a conclusion Mm. that there are probably something in the region of 30 to 40 warheads in this particular base, and they are stored in these particular hangars. And there are so many American servicemen who have a history of stewardship of nuclear weapons, etc. So it's like it's, mm, it's mm. like just it's looking for needles in relatively small haystacks mm. and finding the evidence so that you can accumulate the number of warheads in each of these different air bases and come to uh, the conclusion that the US deploys somewhere in the region of 200 to 240 B61 12 nuclear bombs that are delivered by Allied aircraft. I'll give you another example. Israel does not declare that it has any nuclear weapons, and uh, but everybody knows that it. But everybody does. knows, yeah. And, uh, and so there's no official information to go by at all. But the reason why people feel confident in being able to estimate rough numbers of nuclear warheads is because of the core component being fissile material, plutonium, that uh, the Israelis have developed over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. And we can judge the quantity of materials by the operation of the Dimona nuclear power plant that produced the plutonium. So again, we don't know, but we have a sense that the Israelis have roughly one to 200 nuclear warheads. That sort of mm. order. And of course, it's also, I was just going to say, it also it makes sense for those nations deploying warheads as well is to also not necessarily completely try and disguise any of mm. this or mask mm. it. Uh, because part of the deterrent is the fact that these things are exactly. out there and that they are ready yeah. to go. Uh, so there's, a, again, there's a symbiotic relationship between those looking for it and those wanting to be uh, found, exactly. uh, notwithstanding the fact that there's a uh, a high level security arrangements as to how they will actually be deployed, who will deploy it from where, at which point in time, or who will make the ultimate order to deploy them. I mean, we know that we've been close to nuclear war a number of times over the decades. And, and I guess this has been always a question of mine when it comes to nuclear threat. What measures are actually in place to prevent a nuclear war occurring purely by accident. We famously know of uh, you know, Stanislav Petrov, who some say saved the world because he refused to pass on the information to his chain of command that allegedly what he saw on his screens was American ICBMs being launched and they should have obeyed orders and actually informed the superiors, which would have es- escalated the situation and potentially counterattacked. What are the safeguards that exist currently that you're aware of, of preventing these kind of accidental Nuclear wars. Yeah. So, so the first thing to say here is that nuclear weapon command control systems are extremely complex. They are different in different states, but they involve machines and they involve human beings, obviously. <laughs> and any mm-hmm. complex system involving machines and human beings can fail. So there is no fail safe with these systems. There is always the possibility of accidental launch or of miscalculation or of escalation getting out of control. And those three dimensions are possibly the most important of all when it comes to the risk of nuclear use. And of course, states do not want to be using nuclear weapons by mistake, by accident or by escalation, Mm. unless there's a really important reason why they're using them. So they do have mechanisms to try to protect them, to ensure that there is verification of early warning missiles incoming. There are protocols, there are mechanisms whereby one person is not the person who is taking the decision, but it requires several people. And each one of those people deciding to launch needs to go through some kind of a system. But in the end, there are ways in which those systems may fail. And that's the unfortunate thing 
with nuclear weapons is that it only takes one failure. So they try to have really strong systems to avoid the use. But as I say, it's not possible. And, and of course, it's also mm-hmm. important to say that this is getting a bigger problem, actually, rather than a problem getting better. You'd think technology and the rest would improve the situation. But actually, what we're witnessing at the moment is the arms race moving into a much more qualitative arms race where we have emerging disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and incredible sensing capabilities and the like that is starting to disrupt the stability such as it was of these command and control systems. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So as I alluded to earlier, the British have this system where they have a submarine out at sea at any one time, stuffed with at least 40, and now it could be more, warheads on Trident missiles. And the whole system is predicated on the idea that this submarine cannot be detected. This submarine does not communicate with uh, headquarters. So if that submarine were to be taken out at any time, the British Navy would not know it. And we have the development of drone technologies, uh, sensing technologies, artificial intelligence, networked autonomous systems emerging at rapid pace, which suggests to me, if not to the British Navy, that those submarines could be detected much more easily in a few years' time than they have been in the past. And so you can imagine a scenario where the British are squaring up to some opponent, believing that they have uh, nuclear weapons in the back pocket to deter that opponent. The opponent may be able to take that submarine out and know that they've taken it out and then square up to the Brits so that there's overconfidence in the strategic conflict Mm. that then emerges, which makes it all the more likely that there would be some kind Mm. of a serious strategic conflict with global consequences. Mm. Mm. I really like that, the the overconfidence piece. I mean, I've recently interviewed Ned Dobosch, who's a a professor of of military ethics here in Australia, and he he looks at this in war as often a cause for war because, you know, overconfidence can, again, and your own confirmation bias will make you believe that you are stronger than you arguably are. Uh, And I guess we're seeing that very much play out in Ukraine at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, which is also an interesting question because we, we've seen the oftentimes abysmal state of Russian weapon systems, be they vehicles or any of the artillery pieces that we've seen where, you know, the tires were blown out because they just haven't been serviced or, uh, you know, the, the maintenance has been rather poor. Can we trust that their nuclear arsenal has at least been <laughs> kept up to scratch that it's not going to have some sort of a decay or or malfunction purely because of poor maintenance? So um, trust is not a word I'd use in this situation, no. Uh, uh, And we we do know very little about the maintenance and stewardship of Russia's nuclear arsenal. We know a lot more about the American stewardship of nuclear weapons. And Mm. we know that in recent years, we've had a number of people fired for being drunk whilst in charge of nuclear weapons, people who have cheated in exams. We've had nuclear weapons flown by mistake from one base to another without any authorization. You know, there are plenty of examples of lax behavior within the US system. And and it's understandable. I mean, most military people do not like nuclear weapons, right? They're really boring. When you're uh, preparing for uh, conflict and it's hand-to-hand fighting, you know the training is exciting and the and the execution has a has a certain drama to it. With nuclear weapons, you're sitting there doing nothing, twiddling your thumbs, filling in a lot of paperwork. In your principal task is to avoid detection, and so it's like going very slowly, very cautiously, even being seen as a bit weird because you're not going towards the enemy you're running away you know mm. it's it's like everything mm. about mm. nuclear weapons is demoralizing and and the potential use of them is even worse so i i'm not at all surprised that it's really difficult to keep human beings motivated 
when it comes to uh, deploying nuclear weapons. And in this country, mm. in Britain, we're, we're finding it really difficult to crew the submarines because you know, the young people on those submarines, there's a lot of discipline required and it's a lot of sitting around doing nothing. So... Mm. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you're one of the designers of the stepping stones approach to disarmament, and, and maybe just to kind of pivot onto some more positive yeah. and optimistic <laughs> angles of this. Sounds uh, good. Of this story, sounds good. <laughs> so, so what does the approach mm. offer, and what underpins it? Yeah. So you and I are speaking just now, in just in advance of the first meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, happening in Vienna. This mm. is June, and that's otherwise known as the Ban Treaty. And, and the reason why I start there is because the Ban Treaty grew out of a deep frustration amongst non-nuclear weapon states with the progress, or rather lack of progress, of uh, nuclear disarmament obligations that the nuclear weapon states, the recognized five, that's the US, Russia, mm -hmm. China, Britain, and France, had agreed to in 2010. They agreed to a 64-point action plan, and there's been very, very little progress and actually, I think, fair to say, backsliding in the nuclear mm. disarmament agenda. And a whole bunch of states went through quite a process which ended up with the United Nations General Assembly agreeing this treaty. And uh, we now have quite a sizable number of states that have joined this. It basically, it bans nuclear weapons. But of course, it only bans nuclear weapons in those states that sign it. Mm. What I saw in that approach was I thought, this is understandable, but it's not actually going to get us closer to the nuclear disarmament that we need. Another way of putting that is, so we've created the the people like I was, you know, the protests, the anti-nuclear brigade, and that's crucial. That brigade is crucial to putting pressure and articulating the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. But we also need people on the inside working with the nuclear weapon states to take the step-by-step -step approach to getting rid of nuclear weapons because we can't wish them away. Mm. They're not going to go away tomorrow. We need to build the regime gradually that will get rid of nuclear weapons. So we have the vision mm. articulated by the Ban Treaty, but I also persuaded the Swedes, and this is a story worth telling. Mm. I worked with officials within the Swedish foreign ministry for about a year on creating this stepping stones approach that articulates the vision of nuclear disarmament approaches the nuclear weapon states with ideas and proposals of how they may reduce the risk of use, uh, start to build confidence and trust that is necessary towards building down the nuclear arsenals and gradually releasing their grip on nuclear deterrence postures. And as non-nuclear weapon states, we would approach the nuclear weapon states with these ideas as openings for dialogue. So the idea was that we would propose X, Y, and Z, saying that X, Y, and Z we recognize probably don't work. But if they don't work, mm. then tell us what will work, and let's work together to build the confidence necessary to take these first steps. And as we take those first steps, relationships start to strengthen, the world changes a little bit, and perhaps steps start to emerge that we weren't aware of before, and we can start to walk along a path that is a little uncertain at this mm. stage that takes us to greater confidence. And so in a sense, it's a sort of combination of radical vision guiding the process along with very pragmatic, collaborative, inclusive steps. And the Swedes like this approach, but they mm -hmm. but their mm. foreign minister was unconvinced. And so I had a meeting planned with her in New York, and I was staying in an Airbnb with a friend of mine, John, and I was about to go to this meeting, and I thought, now I'll take John with me. So we go to this meeting, we sit opposite the foreign minister with nine of her officials beside her, and I start to introduce myself. I say, you know, I 
organized demonstrations, uh, break into air bases. I believe passionately I've devoted my life to nuclear disarmament. My views have not changed, but my methods have evolved. And mm. the Stepping Stones approach is what I'm trying to persuade you of. And then here's John. And John said, Hello, Minister. I'm Rear Admiral John Gower. I was Assistant Chief of the Defence Staff in the UK, responsible for the whole nuclear weapons enterprise. I commanded nuclear weapons submarines. I believe passionately in nuclear deterrence, but I think Paul's on to a really good thing here, and we're cooperating together. And the rest of the meeting was done because actually we personified what it is we're trying to achieve globally which is nuclear weapon mm. states working with non-nuclear weapon states, working with each other, you know, Russia and the US. Even today, in the middle of a war, it's important that we work together with people whose views make our skin crawl, because it's only if we actually mm. start to recognize and have empathy and compassion for people who have beliefs that we fundamentally disagree with, that magic can happen in the world. And when John and I get together, we disagree on all sorts of things, but we understand where each of us is coming from. And we have some compassion and willingness to share our perspectives and to understand each other, even whilst we disagree. And that's the mm, model for mm. the world that we need. It's not about giving one's own ideas up. It's not even about compromise, actually. It's more about understanding that truth is multidimensional mm. and that we only have mm. a very partial access to truth. Our access to truth is important and we need to hold it but not to grip it too hard and not to force it on mm, other people. Mm, yeah. And the density of relationships, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. It keeps coming up the empathy and understanding what motivates the other person mm -hmm. and therefore stroking those motivators to look for a common goal or a common purpose. It might not be tomorrow, next week. It, it might be 50 years from now, but it, I guess that's the stepping stone exactly, idea. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And we don't know where we'll end up. It's actually, actually yeah. opening to the idea that not knowing where we end up is actually mm. a strength because it means that we can have humility and it means that we can open to other people coming in and co-creating the situation mm. rather than mm. us driving it mm. in a very forceful way. And once we had uh, convinced the Swedes, it appeared to be re – well, I mean, it wasn't my job, it was the Swedes' job – but they persuaded 15 other countries – significant countries across the world to join them in their initiative. And that Stockholm initiative, based upon our Stepping Stones approach, has become possibly the most hopeful dimension within the nuclear disarmament diplomatic world as we speak, although it's very difficult to tell because there are so many factors in play, including the Ukraine war, mm. of course. And we're working up towards the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in August, which has this enormous shadow of the threat of nuclear use in Ukraine hanging over it. But the Stockholm Initiative, mm. the Stepping Stones approach, is a small beacon of hope in an otherwise very dark situation. And yeah, and an obviously very important one. And and just judging by the passion that you tell it, uh, one that's a guiding light for mm. you. So there's many other questions I could ask, but mm. I think I want to leave it on that positive mm -hmm. and op optimistic note, uh, because I think it, it is important to not be overshadowed by the darkness of this topic. Mm because there are people like you out there who are actually trying to do something and moving it all along. Uh, I guess may maybe my last question is, because it does feel for us regular everyday civilians who, you know, or, or people who don't live and breathe this problem, mm. it feels so distant and, and it's very easy to feel helpless about being able to do anything about it. But if there is anything that we can do about it, what would it be? It would be actually to let go of the focus on the nuclear weapons and to think about how the challenges that nuclear weapons are a symptom of flow through all of our lives. So, you know, I talked a lot earlier about nuclear weapons, command and control and all the rest of it. But actually, the really interesting thing is how human beings interact with each other and how they can sometimes reach for tools or techniques that damage relationships. 
We all know how we can fall into conflict with our neighbours or with members of the family and mm. over really foolish, stupid things. And actually, if we can instead start to value the differences of perspective that we all have, then that's probably the best way of achieving nuclear disarmament, tackling the global mm. catastrophic mm. risks we face, be it climate change or anything else, and building a better society. It happens, the first steps are inside. The first steps are coming to recognize that some of the difficulties and challenges that we face are opportunities to really learn about how we can be effective members of society. And then the next challenge is to have compassion and empathy for those that appear to have a mm-hmm. very different perspective, different culture, different understanding, different worldview, and to en- engage with those people with an openness and a curiosity rather than a feeling of threat or challenge to one's own view. So letting go a little bit of the defensiveness and opening up to the wonder that is this world that we live in. Such a wonderful message, and I think particularly relevant with all the division, not just nuclear, Mm. but all of our culture wars Mm -hmm. and climate change and everything else where we're being pushed to extremes. We need to recognise that we agree on most things Mm. and we should embrace that, uh, I guess, that bubble in the middle. Paul, I knew this would be a fascinating conversation. Uh, It's been a long time coming, Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's uh, certainly surpassed my expectations. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the work that you do. I think it's absolutely important work that happens, unfortunately, in the shadows, fortunately, as far as the weapons are concerned, but about the the work that you and uh, uh, your colleagues Mm. do. Uh, So thank you very much for your time and for everything you do. Likewise, Mas. Really appreciate it. And I'm hoping that we can work together coming in the future. I hope so. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Voices of War. And since you got this far, please take a moment to like and review the show wherever you get your pods. Also, if you're able, please consider showing your support through our Patreon page. The link is in the show notes. Thank you, and until the next time.